Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us. This is day five of seven of Coffee with Dr. Tom. And today is detoxing, how and why when you clean the house, everyone lives happily ever after. And uh, this is probably gonna be the most shocking day of all uh, for um, the information that I want to give to you this week. Uh, first, lots of gratitude. Thank you so much for being here and allowing us to do this work and carry this information out to you, making the world a better place. That's our goal. And uh, today is my mother's birthday. And our mom passed a number of years ago, but I'm asking my mother and all of her angels to be around today, excuse me for being a little weird, uh, uh, protecting all of us and helping us all to hold the information that I'm about to give you so that it doesn't just freak us out and immobilizes us so that we don't do anything, but rather to help guide us into listening as my mentor, Dr. George Goodhart would say, listen with ears that hear, right? So we wanna hear this information today, kind of chew it around a little bit, and then listen to some of the steps of what we can do to protect ourselves and our family. These were the numbers two days ago from Johns Hopkins of the number of cases in the world, and this was updated by them this morning. And our current numbers are well over 1.25 million people worldwide confirmed with this virus. And if you look on the far left, you see that the US is leading the world. Easy to miss the importance of this, very easy to miss. And it actually is 26% of all the confirmed cases in the world are in the US. And we've heard that it's going to be another couple of weeks before the number of cases starts to flatten out in the US because we were late to the game in isolation and quarantine. Uh, and we're going to see this numbers going up. And, but I'm going to talk to you about what can we do to protect ourselves. But first we have to realize it's the US that's suffering more than anyone else in the world right now, according to Johns Hopkins. So let's take a look at this. Yesterday, we talked about only 12% of Americans are metabolically healthy, meaning how their body works is the way it's supposed to. One in two of us have diabetes or are pre-diabetic because we've born and raised eating so much sugar in our lives. It throws our blood sugar system way out of balance. And there's a whole lot that can be done to bring it back into balance. We can't do that today, but do know there's lots of good information on that. One in three of us have non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, mostly contributed to by all the bad fats we eat, but other things too that have contributed to this. 75% of Americans are overweight. 42% of Americans are obese. We're carrying spare tires around us. And we know that for overweight people, they're more than two times more likely to have a severe reaction to this virus and obese people are more than three times more likely to have a severe reaction to exposure to the virus. So the question is, why are Americans the number one group in the world that are demonstrating symptoms and getting confirmed cases of this virus? It is not because we're doing more testing. We are not yet. We're going to talk about testing tomorrow and what the current cutting edge tests are and when can we expect to be able to get them done? But why Americans? And what I'm about to talk to you about will be an aha as to why this is happening. Any slide that has pearls on it, it's a pearl, pick up on it. And this one, of course, from my mentor and the father of functional medicine, Dr. Jeffrey Bland, saying that it's important to remember that COVID is a lifestyle disease, meaning most people are not gonna have a bad reaction to being exposed to the virus. We know about 20% of the people will have to go to the hospital, but the 80% don't. And why? It's because of the strength of their immune system. That is the only factor that's been identified why people do not have to go to the hospital when they're exposed to this virus. Because most people don't have a severe reaction. Those that do are those that have compromised immune function. That's a big picture view that if we understand that, then the question comes up, 
how can I strengthen my immune function, which is the bottom line in protecting yourself and your family? What can I do to help my immune system do a better job? And yesterday we talked about fevers and that fevers are good for you up to a degree. Uh, and every day we had some piece of the puzzle of what you can do. So we know about 20% will have to go to the hospital. And our goal here in this seven day series is to reduce that number so that more people do not have a severe reaction. Remember this bar at five days are those that notice they have sore throats, a little bit of a fever, maybe a little loose bowels or diarrhea. And of them, 20% will have to go to the hospital. So we want to reduce that number that gets symptoms. That is the dotted line before the five days here. Less people get symptoms and less people have to go to the hospital with a severe reaction. That's the goal here. And so what are some of the things that we need to understand in order to accomplish that goal? It's what we do in our lives that determines the strength of our immune system. And many people have said, but I live a good life. I live a good life and I don't, um, I'm still, I got sick. You know, I live a good life. I, I'm not eating a lot of junk. I live a good life. Today's information will be a game changer for those people and the others. So notice that this photographer is facing us with a camera and he doesn't know what's in his environment. He doesn't know the dangers that he's facing. That's how it is for most of us with the dangers we're facing that I'm going to talk about today. And I'm gonna talk about what you do about it, you know, how to protect it, but you, you, you won't take the actions to protect yourself if you don't know what's behind you, right? So we have to take the actions so that we can develop a different approach to our environment, right? And we can, we can live more uh, peacefully in our environment, that's the goal. And every day we've emphasized the importance of the rainbow diet, having multiple colors of the rainbow that you eat every day, every day, multiple times a day. Because one of the things we talked about, polyphenols in berries, uh, blueberries, red raspberries, blackberries. I didn't talk about mulberries because they're not commercially available. But if you've got a mulberry tree, you are blessed. And in the springtime is when you can harvest another month or two in Michigan. Um, and they start harvesting and they make a mess on the ground around them. That's why there's not as many mulberry trees. But all the berries, acai berries, many different berries, they all have polyphenols. Red wine, it's the polyphenols in red wine. Um, the primary one's called resveratrol that help to strengthen your immune system, that sharpen the teeth of the Pac-Man that we have in our immune system, killing bacteria, killing viruses, protecting them, not letting them grow and penetrate our cells. That's what polyphenols do. So we want to have lots of polyphenols every day, more than we've ever had before. Extremely safe for you and extremely good for you. Yesterday, I talked about the blue zones. And if you want to know, who are the people that live long, healthy, vibrant lives? It's those that live in blue zone cultures into their 80s and 90s and over 100. And what are the common features of these people all over the world, wherever they're at? These are the nine features. And for those of you that weren't there yesterday, number two, Hari Hachibu, means eat 20% less. So get smaller plates. If you have 12 inch plates, Give them to um, Red Cross or Salvation Army when you can and get nine inch plates. You know, just get smaller plates because we don't feel full until 20 minutes after we've actually had more than enough to eat. So we keep eating after we are full because the hormones of full take about 20 minutes to get to us. Why is that? One of the reasons I think is that our ancestors didn't get access to food very often. So they're full but they better eat a little more in case they can't get any food tomorrow. And so it takes about 20 minutes before the body says, okay, that's enough, I'm done now. And we call it, I'm full, right? But in today's culture, we've got access to food all the time. So you want to recognize, well, you know, I'm just gonna eat a little slower or I'll just have a single portion. I won't have a second portion 
uh, for 20 minutes. I'm still hungry, I'll eat it then. That's Hari Hachibu, and this is a great book to read because there are so many little bullet points in there that you can take away. So today's topic is detoxing, how and why when you clean your house, everyone lives happily ever after, right? And that's what we want for ourselves and our families in living happily ever after. And uh, uh, I've said this on a number of days, I'll start this session off by that. The most important thing you can do is make sure you're well hydrated. More important, I think, than anything else. They're all important. But if your four lane highway is tapered down to one lane, meaning you're backed up, then uh, everything slows down. And the toxins that we're exposed to every day have more time impacting on your brain cells, impacting on your kidney cells, impacting on your liver cells, on your gallbladder cells, on your eye cells, that if your bloodstream's backed up with toxins, it's really hard to be metabolically healthy. So you wanna make sure you're drinking a half ounce of water per pound body weight, not orange juice, not apple juice, water. Now orange juice is okay in, in moderation, but it's water because anything else aside from healthy water, your body has to do something with. It has to make some enzymes. It has to bring some balance to the pH. It has to do something. Healthy water doesn't have to do anything with it. It just takes it right in. So half ounce per pound body weight. You weigh 150 pounds, that's 75 ounces of water a day. That's more than a half gallon. So, oh my God, I'll be peeing all day. That's the idea here is that we have to be flushing out, flushing out. So that's number one on the list. And all the points I'm gonna give you today and many more are in this book that came out last year, You Can Fix Your Brain. And this book, I'm bringing it up here because of the subtitle, Just One Hour a Week to the Best Memory, Productivity and Sleep You've Ever Had. This is the key to su success because it's very easy to get overwhelmed by all of the information that you hear right now. And so how can you hold it? How can you implement it? When you learn seven things, how can you implement all of that? So in a big picture, one hour a week, every Tuesday after dinner, every Sunday after services, whenever it is, but one hour a week. But now because we're in quarantine and isolation, maybe one hour a day, because you have a little more time. But just, just for a little bit of time, just to learn one thing so you're not too overwhelmed and you implement that one thing. And tomorrow you learn one more good thing. So it may be, where am I going to get the polyphenols that Dr. O'Brien and other doctors are saying I need to eat every day to help prevent the virus from penetrating inside your cells? That's what the polyphenols do. And so the virus can't get into the cell. It can't hang out in there. It can't make more virus in there because it can't get into the cell. And that happens because of primarily because of the amount of polyphenols that you have, right? So every day, at least an hour a day right now. And I want to show you this book, number one in a number of different categories on Amazon, because it's really a good book about how do you begin the process of changing the direction. In this book, it was about the brain, but everything in here in the book relates to your immune system, everything in there. I could have made this book, You Can Fix Your Immune System. And I would have put different examples and case studies in it. But what you learn about where all of the insults coming from is the same for heart disease, for immune system diseases, immune system incompetencies, which when people get sick with COVID, their immune system is incompetent in getting the job done. And so as you learn all these little things and you implement one at a time, the result is you get sharper teeth on your Pac-Man of your immune system, killing whatever's not supposed to be there. So let's start with some of the information now. This comes from the American Academy of Pediatrics. And uh, arguably, and this was published in the Journal of Pediatrics, arguably the most important journal health journal in the English language for children's health, arguably the number one journal. And this was a policy statement, which meant it came from the board. This wasn't a doctor writing his opinion. This came from the board of the American Academy of Pediatrics. 
which means they want every pediatrician in the world to know this information. That's how important it is. What did they say? The Toxic Substance Control Act of 1976, which is still the governing regulations on introducing chemicals in our, into our environment at the federal level. This is still the guidelines. Is widely been ineffective in protecting children and protecting pregnant women and the general population. It's ineffective, it doesn't work. And in the over 40 years that this guidelines, these guidelines have been the regulations, only five chemicals or classes of chemicals have been regulated in over 40 years. Thousands are introduced every year, I'm not exaggerating, thousands a year, but there's no regulation. And I'll show you why. I'll show you what the lobbyists for the chemical industry they were so successful in paying off the senators and the representatives, excuse me, but paying them off to pass legislation that had no teeth. And if you go back and you read the history of what was going on as this legislation, the TSCA was going through the channels of Congress, so many environmental groups were screaming out and they just got suppressed by the dollar, the mighty dollar. But this is what we're left with 40 years later and what's happened to us in the last 40 years. The processes are so cumbersome that now, now it's 40 years of existence. TSEA has only regulated five chemicals or chemical classes of the tens of thousands of chemicals that are in commerce. Costs of safety testing are borne by the public. Manufacturers do not have to prove their chemicals are safe and they don't have to collect any data from tests that may be performed by others. They don't have to show anything about how safe some new chemical is. That means rubber and the new rubbers that they invent every year, You know the new chemicals they use in rubbers. They don't have to prove they're safe, but they're now in our environment. That means plastics, the phthalates, the category of chemicals that mold plastic. They don't have to prove they're safe. It's startling. When I first thought, read this, I thought, oh, come on, that can't be true. Our government wouldn't do that. Yes, they did. And that's what we're left with 40 years later. Not the topic for today, but why do you think autism is going through the roof? When I came into practice, it was one in 10,000 children were on the autism spectrum. Now, the CDC tells us one in 36. Why? And you know, your brain is a canary in the coal mine, but we're not going there today. But that's what the book, you can fix your brain is all about and what the impact has been by these regulations. Without sufficient information on the safety or health effects of chemicals, it's impossible for the EPA to engage in any appropriate regulation. And they don't have the resources to do the studies to see if these chemicals are safe or not. They are not authorized to hire scientists to do this. This is what we're up against, all of us. The TSCA places the burden of obtaining information about the potential toxicity of a chemical on the public rather than the manufacturer. Now, I didn't put the, I'll back up one, I didn't put the slide in here, but if you go to the Environmental Protection, um, Environmental Working Group, EWG.org, the studies are right there. Every newborn child in America has over 200 chemicals, some studies say 280 chemicals in their bloodstream at birth that aren't supposed to be there. And many of them are neural toxins. And I'll show you the effect of some of those in a minute. So this article in Pediatrics went on to say it's approximately 27 trillion pounds of chemicals that are produced or imported into the U.S. every year. Now, if you take the population of the US, about, I think it was 327 million people when I did this, and you divide it by 27 trillion, it's 247 pounds of chemicals per person per day that are manufactured or imported into the United States. And that doesn't include pharmaceuticals or petrochemicals. It's like, what? 247 pounds, that's five 50 pound bags per person per day are being imported or manufactured in the US and being spread in our environment in one form or another. And newborn kids have over 200 of these chemicals in their bloodstream at birth because mom 
had too many of these toxins in her bloodstream and never knew it. Mom thought she was healthy, but she's loaded full of these toxins. Remember in the US that um, only 18% of us are metabolically healthy, right? So here's a study that came out that shows you the impact of some of these chemicals. They looked at 328 pregnant women. They collected their urine in the eighth month of pregnancy and they measured phthalates in the urine, which are chemicals that mold plastic. And they only measured five phthalates. There are many, but they only measured five. One of them, BPA. Many of you have heard of bisphenol A, BPA, and we look for BPA-free bottles now and things like that. Well, they're just using BPS, which is more toxic than BPA, but uh, uh, that's BPA. So they looked at BPA and, and five others, four others, excuse me, looked at five total. What'd they find? They took the children of those pregnancies and when the kids turned seven years old, they did Wexler IQ tests on all of them. That's the official IQ test um, uh, to see um, how, uh, what's a child's potential, what's, what's their IQ. And what did they find? In the follow-up study of children prenatally exposed to phthalates, meaning mom was loaded with phthalates, they found significant associations between exposure to phthalates and IQ. Well, what does that mean? They took the results of mom's urine test and they divided them into four categories. The lowest category of phthalates in urine, the next one, the third one, and the highest quartile of phthalates in urine in pregnancy. Then they measured the kid's IQ after birth at seven years old. Kids turn seven years old, they measured their IQs. what did they find? Every child in the lowest quartile of phthalates in urine in pregnancy compared to the children in the highest quartile of phthalates in urine and pregnancy. Every child whose mom had the highest level, their IQ was 6.6 .6 to 7.6 points lower. Now that doesn't mean anything to anybody until you realize that one point difference in IQ is noticeable. Seven point difference in IQ is the difference between a child working really hard, getting straight A's, and a child working really hard, getting straight C's. This child doesn't have the wiring, doesn't have the neural network, doesn't have a chance in the world of doing great in school, irrespective of their genetics, because their brain and their nervous system never developed properly. The wires didn't develop properly. You wanna check this out? Just go to Google, that great library, and type in phthalates and neurogenesis. That's a geek word, but it means nerve growth. Phthalates and neurogenesis. And here come all the studies of how phthalates inhibit nerve growth and brain growth. So here's the result. If mom was in the highest quartile of phthalates of urine in pregnancy, where do you get phthalates? Nail polish. You put nail polish on and the phthalates are in your bloodstream in five minutes. Now, here's how they got away with the TSCA act. There is no evidence that the amount of phthalates that leach out of nail polish into your bloodstream is toxic to humans. There, and that's true. There is no evidence of it whatsoever. There is no evidence that the mercury in fish, when you eat a piece of fish, is toxic to humans. That's true. There is no evidence. There is no evidence that the lead in your vegetables, if you've got lead in the soil in your garden, that the lead in the vegetables is toxic to humans when you eat the vegetables in the garden. That's true, no evidence. How did, but this stuff is accumulative in the body. So these phthalates, these heavy metals, these petrochemicals, they accumulate in your body if your detox capabilities are not adequate. Now give me 25 years of a woman being exposed to phthalates from cosmetics, or from the plastic blinds on the windows in their house because the plastic blinds leach phthalates into the air. There's no evidence that the amount of phthalates that leach into the air from plastic blinds is toxic to humans. Or the plastic, the phthalates in the fake leather plastic covering on your sofa that leaches into the air and you breathe the air. There's no evidence that the amount of phthalates that leach out of your sofa from fake leather uh, is toxic to humans, but this stuff accumulates and it's the accumulative load of the 247 pounds per person per day that accumulates in your body. 
that is wearing out our immune systems. That's the bottom line, because your immune system has to fight all this stuff. As soon as it gets to a certain level of accumulation in the body, your immune system says, that's it, no more, that's too much. Now your immune system has to use its precious energy to fight phthalates, to fight bisphenol A, to fight lead, to fight mercury, to fight any of the 247 pounds of chemicals that are introduced into our environment per person per day, every single day. You understand me here? Now, mom, give me a 28 to 30 year old woman, you know, who has been um, living as healthy a life, maybe a few uh, fast food burgers once every month or two, you know, drinks pop or something, all of the accumulated chemicals from a lifetime of what we as Americans think is okay to eat this garbage. Well, I don't feel sick when I eat it. No, but this stuff accumulates and it wears you down, wears you down, wears you down. That's why only 18% of us are metabolically healthy. That's why I believe we're going to see a continued rise in the percentage of confirmed cases of people who are sick with COVID in the United States compared to the world. We're 26% of everybody right now, but I think it's going to get worse because we are such a toxic, chemically toxic world here that we live in and we don't pay attention to it. We just go on in our lives and because it's so overwhelming, we don't know what to do about it. I'm gonna show you what to do, but we have to understand all of this first. Oh, let me back this up. So similar associations were found with these phthalates and perceptual reasoning, meaning thinking about something and reasoning as to what the best plan of action would be. Working memory, these kids' memory isn't as good. And processing speed, meaning how long does it take them for say one plus one equals what? That's processing speed, two. Or is it one plus one? Oh, it's two. That's processing speed. All of those were affected by if mom had higher levels of phthalates. These kids don't have a chance of having a healthy, vibrant brain function life. They don't have a chance because of the toxicity in mom. This is the world that we've inherited. This is the world that my generation allowed to occur. And if we don't get wake up to this and take immediate action, we're gonna see more responses to any threat that comes into our lives, any health threat. We're gonna see more responses in the US than in other places because we're so toxic. Here's another study for the guys out there saying, ah, I'm fine, that's fine. So we know that sperm is so important, sperm count to measure how well can a male impregnate a female, meaning continuation of the species. There are seven different reasons here, and I only showed you the first two, uh, that if you have a low sperm count, it predicts all-cause mortality, or morbidity means getting sick. Uh, all right, I'm, what's, what's it got to do with me? I've got plenty of sperm. Really? Well, in this study, they looked at all, it's called a meta-analysis. They looked at all the studies between 1974 and 2011 on sperm count in healthy men. Not pregnant, not, not infertile men, healthy men. And what did they find? So let's just skip all that geeky stuff. There's a 59% reduction in sperm count in the last 37 years. 59%. Now that doesn't mean anything to anybody until you realize scientists worry about extinction of a species at 72% loss of sperm count. We're at 59% in 37 years. What do you think is going to happen in the next 20 years? These chemicals that I'm talking about, they bind to estrogen receptors in women and, and in men. They bind to testosterone receptors in men and in women. And the result is the more of these chemicals you accumulate, the less hormonal balance and hormonal function you have. So when people have hormonal problems, you have to look at the toxic load along with um, uh, other uh, mechanisms that can cause those hormonal problems. The toxic load that we all are under is something that we're blind to. There's a wonderful book by Dr. Joe Pizzorno, one of the uh, initial founders and supporters of uh, functional medicine and the, the founder of Bastyr Naturopathic University and his book, the, Tox, uh, the Toxic Load. It's a wonderful book that puts all this in perspective 
and talks about many, many good things that you can do to reduce the risk for you and your family. My books talk about that too. My friend Mark Hyman's books talk about it. So many of us in functional medicine, our books talk about how do you detox. My friend uh, uh, John Klein, Dr. John Klein wrote the book Detoxify for Life about eight or nine years ago. That's a great book also, but we have to get educated on this. One hour a week in general will be enough and it'll take you six months, but you'll get this down. You will get it down. You'll start using nail polish that's phthalate free, organic nail polish and cosmetics that are organic and phthalate free. I give you three URLs in the book. Here's three companies that have phthalate free organic nail polish or cosmetics. Check them out. Or here are three URLs to get glass containers for your kitchen. So you stop using plastic storage containers for food because you put food, leftover chicken in a plastic storage container in the refrigerator, the next day the chicken's got phthalates in it. The plastics leach into the food. The, the plastic tops on coffee cups. You, you, you'll learn so much as you just spend an hour a week to learn about. Remember I said this is overwhelming? I get it, I get it. I'm asking my mom and her angels to watch over all of us uh, uh, while we're doing this so that you don't like zone out here. Please stay with me. I'm gonna talk about what you can do about it. I wanna introduce one more concept first and that is about foods. Because if you have a sensitivity to certain foods, you can have a similar demand on your immune system as chemicals do. And not everybody has a problem with these foods, but if you have a problem, there is a great book that came out called The Plant Paradox. It talked about this world of lectins and plant lectins and agglutinins. One of the things they do is they stick on your tissue. You swallow them, they get into your bloodstream and they cause leaky gut, which I talked about on day two or day three. And they get in your bloodstream and they can stick on your tissue. And if they stick on your tissue, um, it produces something called a neoepitope. That's the lectin or the food itself binding onto your thyroid or binding onto your ovary or binding onto your testes. Here's a slide that shows some of the different lectins and the tissues that they bind to. So it can be wheat. It can be soy, it can be peanuts and lentils, beans, but look at all the different tissues that they can bind to. Now, when they bind to that tissue, it's called a neoepitope, a new cell. It's a geek word. It just means a new cell, something new in the body, a new molecule. What is this thing? And it's a combination of wheat on your stomach lining, wheat on your liver, peanuts on your breast cells, Lentils on your connective tissue, like your joints. It just depends on where it binds. Your immune system sees that and says, I better fight that thing. What is that thing? I better fight that. And then your immune system has to take action. And it makes antibodies against this neoepitope, this new, remember antigen means stimulates an immune response. It makes antibodies against this thing to fight it. So your immune system is using its precious energy to fight lentils or to fight wheat, it just depends on what your sensitivity is as to where it can happen. And that's why it's so important, the foods that you eat to make sure that they're good for you. So you wanna work with a functional medicine practitioner, a integrative medicine practitioner, a holistic practitioner that'll talk to you about foods and you, you don't need to get sick when you eat a food. Only one person in eight that has a problem with wheat has stomach or digestive problems when eat wheat. Only one out of eight. The rest of them have brain problems. They get brain fog or they get joint problems. They're swollen. They can't walk very well in the morning so they take a shower. They get heart problems. They get irregular heartbeats. It just depends on the individual. So it's only one out of eight that feels it in their gut when they eat it. So don't think if you feel fine, the food's okay for you. At some point on your checklist of one hour a week things to do, you wanna learn more about foods and you can read my books and many other books to find more information on that. Now, this is a geeky slide, but I wanted to show it to you because it's very clear. So if you look at the lines down here on the bottom, the, you see soy, corn, and spinach, and tomato, and IgM. These are antibodies that your immune system makes to protect you. And then the same ones, IgG, 
And then the same ones, IgA, these are different antibodies. Remember the immune systems, the armed forces, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard. If you make IgM antibodies to soy, as an example, the darker the box, the more likely it happens, you easily can make antibodies to S100B. What's that? That's a marker of the blood-brain barrier. You've heard leaky gut, you get a leaky brain. And my book talks about that in great detail so you can learn more about it. I know it can freak people out to think about a leaky brain, but you don't get brain deterioration or brain dysfunction, depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, bipolar, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, unless you have a leaky brain. And that's there for years beforehand. So here we see that if you make antibodies to uh, soy, IgM, you're very likely to also make antibodies to S100B. Or the next one with IgM antibodies to soy is myelin basic protein. That's the saran wrap around your nerves. You have elevated antibodies, myelin basic protein. That's the mechanism of MS. And you see for spinach and tomato and corn, uh, for all four of these foods, how your immune system may make antibodies to your brain and your nervous system. I just wanna show you that slide. It's true for your heart. It's true for your liver. It's true for your joints. All these foods or bacteria or viruses, your immune system fights these things. It can fight your own tissue because of a neoepitope, meaning that food molecule hung out on your brain uh, lining, the blood brain barrier. You have a neoepitope, now the immune system has to fight it. Now there are multiple mechanisms, but that's one mechanism that I use as an example for you. You don't have to understand all this stuff at a deep level. So you just need to know that foods can cause brain problems or heart problems or liver problems. Your immune system is using its precious energy. You're eating wheat every day and you got a problem with wheat. Your immune system is using its precious energy to fight wheat and it may not have enough reserves to fight COVID-19, and you're part of the 20% that's gotta to go to the hospital. It happens all the time with flus and autoimmune disease. The list goes on and on and on. My first book was called The Autoimmune Fix, and you really understand. You take six months and just read that book, one hour a week, you get this big picture. Wow, I never knew that. I see how that did this in my life, and I see what it's doing to my grandson. Oh my. And, but just one hour a week so that you don't get too overwhelmed by this stuff. But don't avoid learning more because it's overwhelming. Just take your time in using it. Here I put an example about your thyroid and how these endocrine disrupting chemicals, EDCs, can affect your thyroid, like chlorine and pesticides, bisphenol A, uh, phthalates in general. They all can affect your thyroid and you don't know that. That, but when you start getting thyroid dysfunction and you go to a doctor and they put you on thyroid hormone because you have a problem with your thyroid, you never think it's because of too much phthalates in your body, right? They just give you the medication to hopefully reduce some of your symptoms, which may be necessary for a while until you detox and get this stuff out, out of your body. And then you find you need less medications many, many times. Okay, so that's, you know... It's like crying wolf here, I guess, but we need to know this. It's 247 pounds of chemicals per person per day. And it's all in the book that you can read, but we're gonna give you some information. We're gonna give you some handouts and things um, so that you um, can get some action steps right away. But I wanna remind you, right now, while we're in isolation, an hour a day, just an hour a day so you don't get too overwhelmed, you get too many, actually, I need to do this, I need to do this, I need to do this, and then you get immobilized, right? Just get one thing and implement that. And then the next day, get one thing and implement that. And you'll find that it makes huge changes in your life. So one of the handouts I'm gonna give you is the ways that toxins affect your brain. This comes from Dr. Pizzorno um, from his book. I mean, I'm not gonna read all this. It's just um, shows you some of the mechanisms that how your brain can be affected. But here's a handout that you can use. We're gonna give you this one. You know when you pump gas, how sometimes you can smell the gas? You're smelling benzene. Benzene kills brain cells when you're smelling it. 
Oh, I don't feel bad. When, that's because you've got 10 billion brain cells and you just killed a few hundred thousand. You can't feel that when it happens, right? But give me that over 20 years. So what do you do? Everybody's got to pump gas. So when you're pumping gas, if you can smell the gas, oh, I'm standing downwind. Walk around to the other side of the hose. Now you're standing upwind. You don't smell it anymore. Or hit it on automatic, set that lever on automatic and walk away when you're pumping the gas. Now that's going to reduce your exposure that minimal amount. Now there's no evidence the amount of benzene that you're exposed to when you're pumping gas is toxic to humans. That's how get it, they get away with all of that. But when you do that consistently over 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, you've just done this little base hit that protects your brain. Or what about tap water? There's so many chemicals in tap water. Remember I said you have to drink water and you drink the healthiest water you can. So we tell you about the, the good, better, and best things you can do. And what about clothes? Well, all new clothes are saturated with chemicals to keep bugs off of them until they get into the shop. And so what do you do? You have to wash those clothes. And of course, wrinkle-free clothes are loaded with formaldehyde, and that's a toxic chemical. It causes lots of different diseases. Just type in side effects of formaldehyde. And wrinkle-free clothes have those. So we give you some tips on what you can do. So we're gonna give you the tips, the tip sheets that you can use. And what about bedding? Well, you know, bedding, the chemicals in flame retardant sheets are used, uh, they cause hormone disruptions, lowered IQ, attention deficit, fertility issues, thyroid disease, and can't. Now there's no evidence that the amount of chemicals that leach out of flame retardant sheets are toxic to humans. That's correct. The amount of chemicals that leach in one night out of those, they're, there's no evidence it's toxic, but this stuff accumulates, like your down comforters and the covers on your blankets and things. So we give you some tips on what you can do. Coffee cups and coffee makers, we give you tips on what you can do. Um, all of these little base hits win the ball game. It's important for me to emphasize here today for you, it's overwhelming to do this because we're saying, hey, look, the reason Americans are so prevalent here in having reactions to COVID, one of the reasons is that they're very unhealthy. Only 18% of us are metabolically healthy. One on two is diabetic or pre-diabetic. That's an inflammatory state that suppresses your immune system. And so we have to look at that and say, okay, that's what's going on right now. I don't like that. I don't like that at all, but that's what's going on, okay. What are the baby steps that I can take that won't overwhelm me too much? And you just start with the baby steps and we'll, we'll give you more of the baby steps. Eat the colors of the rainbow every day. Always make sure you're getting plenty of different colors of the rainbow. I talked to you about Finland and how much lower their incidence is of cases of COVID, total cases, total deaths, new deaths, why? Because out of five point some million people in Finland, there's 3.2 million saunas. And their lifestyle is sweating in saunas, flushing out, detoxing. You have to learn to detox. You don't have to do a sauna. If you want to do saunas, we've got information at our website that you can do. But this is an example. Exercise is an example of how important it is. The blue zones, all of these different markers of a blue zone lifestyle are exactly what we need to do right now in this time of COVID crisis. These are the things that will protect you. These are the things that sharpen the teeth on your immune system. These are the things that reduce the toxic load so the precious energy of your immune system can be used to fight the threats that it really should be fighting, not bisphenol A, right? Thank you very much for your kind attention. Tomorrow we're talking about testing and we'll look forward to seeing you then. Thank you.